to a conversation with history. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Barry Eichengreen, who is the party professor of economics and political science at the University of California, Berkeley, where he has taught since 1987. He is also a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research in Cambridge and a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research in London. In 97-98, he was a senior policy advisor at the International Monetary Fund. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he is the convener of the Bellagio Group of Academics and Economic Officials. He's written many publications and papers, but today we're going to focus on two. One is Globalizing Capital, a History of the International Monetary System and the European Economy Since 1945, Coordinating Capitalism and Beyond. He also edited with Richard Baldwin an online book which was very timely called Rescuing Our Jobs and Savings, What G7 Eight Leaders Can Do to Solve the Global Credit Crisis. Barry, welcome to Conversations. Thank you, Harry. Good to be here. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Berkeley, California, so that explains a lot, I suppose. <laughs> And, and looking back, how do you think uh, your parents shaped your thinking about the world? And, and I might add Berkeley. Well, being in Berkeley in the 1960s was an interesting experience. Hmm. Um, I was in high school at the time, and recreation included going down to Telegraph Avenue and smelling the tear gas. <laughs> um, my parents were not connected with the university, but Many of my childhood classmates were sons and daughters uh, of professors and people who would be at my parents' dinner parties. So um, the attractions uh, of the academic life were fairly clear. People in Berkeley at that point in time went in one of two directions, I think. Um, some became musicians and chefs, <laughs> and the others uh, became more uh, concerned about politics and, and policy, so I went in the, in the second direction. And, and around the dinner table, were there discussions about what was going on in the world or about economic issues? There were, um, and I'm sure my household was by no means uh, unique in that respect. It was the, the 1960s, um, so I'm, I'm not really a, a, a child of the 1960s, having still been in secondary school, I'm an infant. Mm -hmm. of the 1960s, but uh, there was uh, a, a lot of consciousness of what was going on. A highlight of that period for me was Robert Kennedy came to the Greek theater in 1968 as part of his campaign, and uh, I shook his hand, the one, president, one presidential candidate whose hand I, I've shaken. And, and, and uh, what, what kind of imprint was left on you, do you think, other than pointing you in the direction of, of, of uh, research that you undertook? It was um, the, the period of, of the Vietnam War as well. So I, the imprint was one to try to do work that was somehow relevant to policy. My other um, deep and abiding interest has been history. So. Uh, the question became, at some level, although I don't know that I ever really articulated it, um, how to use history in a way that could speak to a broader policy-oriented audience. So that may be a simple explanation for how I ended up doing economic history and 20th century economic history in particular. Mm -hmm. And uh, where were you educated? Where did you do your undergraduate work and your graduate work? My undergraduate work was at UC Santa Cruz in the uh, era, more or less, of trailers rather than buildings. And <laughs> just, it had just been formed It had at just that time been uh, founded. started, mm -hmm. and no grades. So mm -hmm. uh, students were encouraged to do cross-disciplinary work and, and define their own majors to the extent that I'm an intellectual trespasser and I work in history and economics mm -hmm. and political science all. That may be a, a, a product of having been at Santa Cruz. My PhD is from Yale, where they had and may still have a well-developed uh, economic history program where I could do uh, 
uh, two years of work in economics, go over to history and do a master's degree, and then complete my PhD in economics. Mm -hmm. And what was your uh, dissertation on? My dissertation w was on the Great Depression. Uh, oh, little, <laughs> little did I know how uh, enduring and relevant that interest would be. Let's talk about a little about being an economic historian. Uh, uh, what, what, what skills are involved? What, 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 what do you have to have in the way of skills that, to, to make this happen? Well, we, we like to tell our students you have to have all, all the skills of a well-trained economist, which means facility and theory and quantitative methods, and then you have to aspire to the sensibility and appreciation of the, the texture of events and of the societies in which they occur that uh, characterizes a good historian. So it, it, it's very hard to mm. hold up uh, both ends of the, of the bargain. I think the best economic historians find enough hours in the day to, to do both. Mm -hmm. and, and talk a little about the, the synergy between these two disciplines, because in, in some ways, uh, at, at the same time that it's a very necessary match, it, it's one that you don't find often unless, unless somebody uh, picks this, this subfield, so to speak, that brings the two together. In what way does economics help history and vice versa? Well, I, I actually think in economics in particular, there is a growing appreciation of economic history and what economic historians do. There has been more consciousness of the importance of institutions for economic development in the wake of uh, the, the transition in Eastern Europe where the institutional inheritance was part of the problem. If you're serious about studying institutions, uh, where do you go to understand their origins and their evolution over time? Where do you go for uh, empirical variation in the data? You, you have to go to history. So I think that uh, economists ha have become more sympathetic to historical method, uh, historical investigation, and, and to what their economic historian colleagues do. Similarly, I, I, I think history departments, not all of them, but many of them, uh, 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 appreciate the advantages in some circumstances of formalism, abstraction, and certainly formal theory, which is increasingly prominent in history. Economic theory, of course, only being um, one example of that. Uh, help our audience understand what you mean by institutions, because that's, that's a, uh, uh, an important element of your analysis and it, 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 it's part, it, it's the way that one comes to understand periods in a way that you wouldn't understand them if you were just focusing on the economics. So institutions are a slippery concept, uh, admittedly. Um, one can think in terms of the formal written constitutional rules and regulations under which uh, uh, a society functions, be they the way contracts are enforced or in the political realm, the electoral college in the United States, or one can think about informal uh, norms and conventions and understandings. I think Douglas North, the economic historian who won the Nobel, Nobel Prize for his work on institutions would uh, prefer kind of a capacious definition that encompassed both uh, uh, the informal and the formal. Uh, and, and in your, uh, you, let me show w one of the books that we're going to discuss briefly before we get into the present. Uh, the book is called The European Economy Since 1945, Coordinated Capitalism uh, and Beyond. Uh, and uh, you're looking here at uh, uh, what made possible uh, Europe's great economic advance in the, in the sort of the first phase of the post-war period. And, and it was a, a, a remarkable coming together of an institutional network in Europe 
on the one hand, but also the demands of technology and the particular kind of economic development required. Talk a little about that, because one had to understand both of these trajectories to see how it all came together. Well, let me uh, give you a little big picture Good. first. I think about uh, two schools of thought on how institutions develop. On the one hand, there's the, the functionalist view, which says there are certain problems that need to be solved, and societies uh, develop institutions that are well suited for solving those problems. The other view would say institutions evolve historically. Something occurred in the past that led to their development. They are social conventions and attitudes and written rules that have persistence, that get locked in and are therefore slow to change. I'm, I have one foot in both camps. Mm -hmm. So my story about Europe in the 20th century would say Europe in the first half of, of the 20th century and in, in, indeed all the way down to 1970 or so faced a, a specific set of economic challenges that needed to be solved. Europe needed high levels uh, of investment to catch up with the United States. It needed a relatively even distribution of income to uh, um, maintain the social peace and mobilize the savings to finance that investment. And it needed a government that could get a big push going, get all the relevant heavy industries up and running at the same time. And it developed a set of institutions well suited to that uh, to solving that problem. So in, on the labor market front, these were the institutions uh, of corporatism that involved uh, collaboration between labor and management on how to organize production. The welfare state, an elaborate welfare state that delivered a relatively even distribution of income and the social peace, and a prominent activist government that mm. intervened in the operation of the economy and got all the relevant industries up and running again. In the fourth quarter of the 20th century, that was no longer the mm -hmm. economic problem to be solved. Europe needed to innovate. It needed more of a private sector-led economy. It began to need more high-powered incentives for entrepreneurs. Yet the old arrangements, mm -hmm. large welfare state, interventionist government, corporatist institutions, remained in place. They were locked in. They had developed a certain inertia. So that is why Europe continues to struggle to mm -hmm. remake itself and to accommodate the very different imperatives of, of the 21st century. And, and so, and, and what, what you're suggesting is there are constraints, both political and economic, because of the institutions in place, to allow the pivot to a new era that has different functional requirements. Yeah, so um, it, the, the different elements of Europe's institutional constellation interact with one another. Mm -hmm. So you can think of a, 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 a clock or a piece of sophisticated machinery. If you try to replace one without replacing the others or adapting the others, mm -hmm. at the same time, the whole mechanism stops functioning. So how to remake a set of interlocking institutional arrangements mm -hmm. is no easy task. Europe has the advantage of having a European Union and a European Commission that can think about and give advice about the big picture and about the whole process of institutional reform. But Europe is a continent of nation states fundamentally, in each of which the, the polity and the government make their own individual mm -hmm. national decisions. The, the other book that you've written, which uh, is, is terribly important in the context of our present uh, 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 economic uh, collapse, is, and I'm going to show it, Globalizing Capital uh, and it, a History of the International uh, Monetary System. And uh, uh, why, let me ask you a, a simple question for us. Why is an international monetary system important? The international monetary system is part of the connective tissue between uh, different national economies. We have China and we have the United States, and they are both producing 
uh, goods and selling them to one another. Among other things, we observed China selling a lot more to us mm -hmm. than we sell to them, something that probably can't go on forever. So the international monetary system made up of exchange rates and capital flows and interest rates is in principle, when it works well, uh, one of the mechanisms through which those imbalances are rectified. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, you, it, it's, it's interesting because the, the reform of the system, when there is a sense of that things uh, need a major adjustment, some, sometimes, uh, it, uh, many times, that becomes very complicated in dealing with the needed reform. And I, and I believe you're saying that uh, on, the, on the one hand, you need uh, a political power or to, to force uh, the system and its individual members to go, do what's good for themselves collectively. But on the other hand, often that doesn't happen. And so there is an inertial quality to the trajectory. And so you get kind of uh, uh, changes that are ad hoc and sometimes work. So the one time that we've had um, fundamental changes uh, in the international monetary system agreed to and implemented by a group of countries was in 1944 at the Bretton Woods Conference in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, where agreement on the form of the post-World War II international monetary system was reached. That reflected two things that don't exist today. Number one, there was a, a broad intellectual consensus uh, opinion makers in different countries agreed on what form that system should take, partly because they had been discussing and negotiating that question for three plus years. And secondly, there were, crudely speaking, only two countries at the table. World War I was still being fought in early 1944. Uh, the UK and the US could agree Mm -hmm. and uh, the, the Canadians had their own point of view, a few others did, but it was basically an Anglo-American agreement. Today's world is different not only because there's less agreement intellectually on the form that international monetary and financial arrangement, arrangements should take, but also because our world is multipolar. And mm -hmm. now we talk in terms of the group of 20 countries it's harder to get 20 to agree than it is to. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think that these, uh, uh, th this background is actually, in, in both the case of both of these books and what we've just talked about, is, is, is useful uh, for, for talking about the uh, uh, present economic uh, 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 crisis that the world confronts and the United States confront, where we're talking uh, just as uh, President Obama uh, has uh, assumed office. And uh, I, I do want to quote one thing actually from the, the Global Finance book, because you say, the development of international monetary system is fundamentally a historical process. And I, I think that that insight is, is very relevant to where we are today. So uh, I guess I, I want to walk you through uh, what the present crisis is about, and then also what we might do about it, and, and your, value, your, your report card on, on how well uh, 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 the international system in the United States has, has responded. So, so how does history help us understand how this crisis came about? Let me give you the following example. Um, many people say, correctly in my view, that uh, the, this crisis was caused by uh, excessive risk-taking, reckless behavior on the part of financial institutions. That is all good and well, but you need to step back and ask, uh, what were the sources of those risk, risks? And I would say they were, um, in substantial part, historically generated. Mm -hmm. Coming out of World War II uh, and coming out of the Great Depression of the 1930s, uh, when the perception was that financial markets had malfunctioned disastrously, everything that moved was 
heavily regulated. Gradually over time, uh, memories of the 1930s faded and we began to deregulate our financial markets in the United States, mm -hmm. as did other countries. So here in the US, we uh, removed fixed commissions on uh, stockbrokers. And this business. goes back to about what year? Let's this goes back, back, I think, to the early 1970s. Okay. And all of a sudden, broker-dealers and others had to figure out, they, their comfortable living went away. They mm -hmm. had to figure out other lines of business, so they branched into uh, doing securitization of mm -hmm. uh, various sorts. And, and, and it's important, because I want our audience to understand, so the brokers essentially were uh, the representatives of the investment banks, basically, that, that and, and suddenly they saw their income as being reduced as uh, commissions were deregulated. So broker-dealers like Bear Stearns, you will have heard the name. Yes, we had a, a whole list of them, yeah. Had been able to make a comfortable living yeah. earlier. With deregulation, other people could infringe on their turf, and they had to figure out a way to supplement their incomes by moving into riskier lines of business, using other people's money, wholesale funding, in order to uh, finance their operations. That's where all the leverage that has been a weak point in the financial system came from. All of a sudden, insurance companies were deregulated, and they could uh, go into similar lines of business as the investment banks. That's how AIG, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the big insurance company, got into all this risky business. So I would say it was a historically rooted process where, with the passage of time, memories of history faded, deregulation occurred, but not all the consequences were anticipated. And, and, and I think it's important to emphasize that th this was a, as a historical process, it was a, it was a bipartisan endeavor over time basically, and, and it, 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 this is one of the uh, things that you mean by institutions, because there was a set of ideas, notions about what made for, uh, uh, for prosperity both at home and abroad. Well, so I've told the story of deregulation, uh, increased leverage and risk-taking, mm -hmm. and ultimately the financial crisis, without referring to people mm -hmm. so far and without referring to political parties. Mm -hmm. You're quite right. So the, the way that I tend to think of things, which I suppose is both a strength and a weakness, is in terms of these historical processes that reflect what happened long before, in this case in the 1930s, and how the consequences unfold over time. But I think one would can't tell this story uh, fully without a role for Ronald Reagan and mm -hmm. the ideology of deregulation. Clearly, individuals mattered, uh, political parties, and, and the ideology of regulation, deregulation, which uh, infused the ideology of the Republican Party all through the end of the, the 20th century, but also, say, the Clinton mm -hmm. administration in the 1990s. And, and it was then that the, the Glass-Steagall uh, 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 reforms of the New Deal uh, were overturned. And, and what is important about that? In other words, ex explain to our audience this, this notion of the conflict between commercial banks and investment banks and what that uh, uh, discarding of the Glass-Steagall legislation meant. Well, Glass-Steagall had been um, imposed in the 1930s to separate deposit taking, uh, households' money should be safe, uh, safely deposited in prudent banks not undertaking risky business, versus investment banking, which was bankers gambling their own funds mm. and not deposits on riskier activities. Um, the perception having been that in the 1920s, uh, uh, bankers had taken excessive risks with other people's money, small savers' money, and that could not be allowed to continue. Um, that memory faded with time, as I said before. And in the United States, we looked to other countries like Germany, which didn't have similar restrictions, and where financial supermarkets, universal banks, uh, they're called, actually 
uh, seemed to be pretty efficient and stable and well managed. So there was pressure to eliminate Glass-Steagall as happened at the end of the 1990s so that American banks could compete with their uh, foreign counterparts. The implication of that being, in my view, conflicts of interest returned. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in addition to that, there was an intensification of competition as commercial banks and insurance companies infringed on the traditional turf of investment banks. Everybody uh, levered up their bets and gambled to survive. Now, th what we've been talking about here is kind of the American domestic environment, deregulation, and of course, uh, uh, America is, uh, in the financial area, the dominant player because our, our financial system was so far advanced. But, but there's another big problem here which uh, I want you to explain to our audience, and that is the global imbalances that began to emerge in the late 90s and then into the 21st century between China and the United States. And, and why did that, what was it and why did that matter? Well, there, there are two explanations for, for this financial crisis. One is uh, reckless deregulation and gambling by people in financial markets. The other one is the global savings glut and the flood of foreign money, uh, in particular Chinese money, into the United States. Uh, the argument there being that the housing bubble would have never taken on the proportions it reached in the first half of this decade without cheap uh, Chinese funding, uh, without the Chinese buying all these uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and U.S. Treasury securities. Um, I'm of the view that the principal culprit was uh, in the United States that we grew our financial crisis at home and we shouldn't blame the Chinese. But I think the global imbalance, the fact that the Chinese were running big trade surpluses and had lots of money that they had to park somewhere and they parked it here was a compounding factor. And, and in all of this, and we'll talk about this again a little later, but what, what's kind of interesting is uh, I guess, <clears throat> and I'm not an expert on international finance, but what gets the sense that these imbalances, uh, th there were ways to deal with the surplus saving that might have benefited the whole international economy, whereas this fed a distortion that was domestically generated in the United States. So uh, what is essentially a poor country on the rise was funding the excesses uh, and the imprudence of the richest country in the world. A number of us had been um, arguing this, that capital, unlike water, flowing uphill from poor to rich countries, and uh, international imbalance of this magnitude uh, were perverse and unsustainable. Um, a number of us ha have had been arguing this since 2004, and the more years passed between 2004 and 2008 when not much gave, uh, I think the less credibility people invested in our arguments. So we were kind of like the, um, uh, the people crying wolf and, and the wolf never quite arrived uh, at the door. So I don't want to take satisfaction in the fact, but in 2008 uh, the wolf became clearly evident. And, and we've had a number of crises since we went off the gold standard, and uh, especially in the 90s, the Asian financial crisis, the collapse of uh, uh, the, the Russian economy, uh, the, the collapse of long-term capital, the hedge fund, and so on. But, but I, I get the sense that you were uh, sanguine about the, the resolution of these crises. Uh, and with the two o with the with our current crisis, you, you're less sure. <laughs> what what me sanguine? He asks. Um, <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't say sanguine, but uh, I would certainly admit, uh, uh, along with the rest of the economics profession, that I uh, failed to anticipate that we could have a crisis of this severity and magnitude. I s certainly worried about the.
disorderly correction of global imbalances, but had a failure of imagination in the sense that I couldn't conceive that the unwinding could be this disruptive mm -hmm. and painful. And uh, I have always been of the view that we learned the lessons of history and that we wouldn't re repeat the Great Depression, mm -hmm. that we had learned enough to avoid the kind of banking and financial collapse experienced in the 1930s. Now it's hard to be confident. You can be hopeful that's correct, but you can't be sure. Now, now let's look at the response of, of uh, the Bush administration. Uh, it, it's very clear that, that it, in, in, in the beginning, they, each crisis they thought was isolatable, that Bear Stearns was, uh, you deal with that problem and, and that would uh, uh, at least deal aggressively with our problems. And that turned out uh, uh, not to be true. What, why did, was there such a failure of imagination on the part of uh, the policy makers uh, as they, uh, was it because they were making it up as they went along? Well, to start with, there was a, a sense of denial, um, certainly a, a reluctance to acknowledge the um, damage to the financial system. So every new financial problem was perceived as isolated. It took uh, the better part of a year for the reality to gradually dawn and, and people in Washington and more generally uh, to realize that this was a, a problem that had infected the entire, that put at risk the entire U.S. financial system. Secondly, uh, I think uh, the people responsible for coping with this crisis, for formulating a policy response, are financial engineers starting with mm -hmm. Hank Paulson and are therefore inclined to the view that there is some kind of limited, clever engineering solution mm -hmm. to the problem. Third, and most fundamentally, is ideology, that there has been a reluctance to think about the possibility that it might be necessary for the government to first to uh, in inject its own money into the banking system and take ownership stakes in the banks, and now there's still a reluctance, has been a reluctance that may or may not change to utter the word nationalization and mm -hmm. to acknowledge that the U.S. government may have to take a majority stake in some of the big banks that are at risk. Do you think that if the uh, response in the beginning had been more aggressive and systematic that it would have uh, slowed down the unraveling or maybe even stopped it? Well, there'll be a lot of um, counterfactual histories written of this uh, in the future. I think um, it's certainly the case that if we had leaned against the wind and raised interest rates more quickly and taken firm steps toward budget balance in the first half of the decade, we could have limited the vulnerabilities that, uh, the problems that came back to bite us subsequently. Um, in, a, in, a, in addition, I uh, do believe that if uh, in the summer and fall of 2008, we had moved to recapitalize the banks quickly, mm -hmm. rather than think there was some clever financial engineering solution using reverse auctions and the TARP Mm -hmm. to take toxic assets off the balance sheets of the banks and do nothing else. That the, um, I think bank capital recapitalization earlier and more forcefully would have made a big difference. I also think that in 2008, we should have acknowledged how rapidly the economy was slowing down mm -hmm. and done more fiscal stimulus at that point than mm -hmm. we in fact did. Mm -hmm. so, so in a way, they were locked in to not seeing the systematic nature of the crisis. D does the failure to save, a lot is made of the failure to save Lehman Brothers. I is that just a, a symptom, a manifestation of a, a systemic crisis and, and people are saying, oh, if we had you know, plugged the dike there, then it wouldn't have unraveled? What, what is your thought on that? So to know how, how, how important the uh, Lehman Brothers 
failure was and whether it could have been averted, um, you either have to be uh, an attorney or <laughs> have to be in the room <laughs> or both. So I'm not, not sure, but um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm of the view that Lehman Brothers was a, a, a symptom of a much larger problem. So even in the hypothetical world where the, the Lehman problem had been, a, been resolved and the subsequent problem with AIG caused by uh, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers had not occurred, there would have been other financial institutions and big banks that would have gotten into comparable trouble later in the year. I'm curious. I want to. I want to get in your in your mind here a second because it. You know, you, you you have this duality. You're an economist and you're a historian, and, and as you're watching this thing unfold, you know, uh, uh, to what extent? Uh, uh, and I'm sure you saw it much earlier than others. Was it was the economist in you that didn't see that? You know, this was a situation that would be handled by people who had learned the lessons of the historian. Or, or, or what? I, I guess I'm, I'm just sort of curious because cause clearly the historian who does your kind of work, who's writing you know, 20 years or 30 years in, in the future, will look back and see a lot of things that, that people living in this area did not see. So I'm reassured that I'm not the only economic historian of the Great Depression who is uh, giving advice about policy at the moment, or not including myself, making policy at the moment. Ben Bernanke is famous as a student of the Great Depression. And in fact, a number of other members of the Federal Reserve Board in the last two years, Rick Mishkin mm. and Randall Krosner, are also students of the Great Depression. Why did the Fed respond early and aggressively to uh, the unfolding of the subprime crisis starting in August of 2007, partly because the board was populated by students of the Great Depression who had learned that the Fed failed to do so uh, in the 1930s. I think there's another side to that coin. However, you know, history can inform policy, mm. but it can also distort policy. So you might ask, why did the Fed respond to the subprime crisis as a banking crisis and not fully appreciate the problems in securities markets or the insurance industry? Mm -hmm. The answer is the crisis of the early 1930s was primarily a banking crisis. That's what they'd learned and studied, and that shaped their perceptions mm -hmm. uh, of current events, not entirely to the good. Mm -hmm. And, and h help us understand then what, what is, at what point does this become systemic in that moves it beyond a banking crisis? I mean, what, 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 what is the insight there about that they didn't have to see this differently than from what the problem had been in the Depression? I don't think the, um, our policymakers fully appreciated counterparty risk. In mm -hmm. other words, the extent to which the failure of Lehman Brothers could create severe financial problems for its counterparties, for other people who'd done business mm -hmm. with it. Because the literature on the Great Depression and the banking crisis of the 1930s doesn't really emphasize counterparty risk with a few uh, exceptions. Um, I don't think that our uh, policymakers uh, currently uh, understand the risks uh, posed by derivative instruments, which have been the, um, the weak link for many financial institutions, partly because derivatives markets were very limited in, in the 1930s. Mm. So again, I'm tempted to say that um, history has shaped current policymakers' perceptions of, of what the crisis is and how to respond it both for good and for ill. Now, now, what what do you see, because as you mentioned earlier, we're in a different world uh, in which there's much more multipolarity. There's an, a, a great emerging power, China, that's still sort of 
getting to to where it it might ultimately land. There is uh, uh, the European Community, the Euro, uh, uh, a major economic uh, force now, and and uh, 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 above them all has been the United States as the the reserve currency. Uh, what will this uh, crisis do to our uh, leading economic role, which which has been like what you described, namely a trajectory which has stayed on course partly out of inertia. It's clear that uh, this crisis has not exactly enhanced the reputation of the United States and the dollar mm -hmm. internationally. Uh, nothing could be more obvious than that. And now we're beginning to see data, for example, that the Chinese are curtailing their purchases of U.S. Treasury bonds and other securities. They're not halting them, mm -hmm. much less selling their existing holdings, but they're slowing their accumulation. Having said that, what's really surprising about the crisis is that the dollar has been a benef beneficiary. Um, and there are two explanations for that. One is what I, I should say, I don't fully understand why the dollar has mm -hmm. benefited given that this is a U.S. originated and distributed crisis. But uh, you ask people in financial markets and they say technical reasons, mm. which means they don't know why the dollar has benefited mm. either. But I think more fundamentally, other economies have been hit equally hard and other currencies ha have suffered at least as much as the dollar. The European economy has been hit as hard as the U.S., so the euro has not risen against the dollar. Uh, the Japanese economy has the most serious recession now of any uh, industrial country in the world because they mainly export automobiles. Nobody, nobody is buying those. And uh, capital goods to China, mm -hmm. and they're not buying those either. So the yen hasn't benefited. Uh, mm -hmm. The dollar is still standing as a reserve currency in part because they're is no alternative currency that looks any more attractive. Now, now, do you do you anticipate that this set of circumstances will uh, uh, push us toward uh, a situation where there's not one major reserve currency, but there are a number of reserve currencies, and that regional groupings, uh, economic groupings, become more important, and, and and new nexes between these regions will be worked out. I, I, I do anticipate something along those lines. So I think um, within a few years, first rule of forecasting is give them a forecast or a number or a date, but never both. So I said a few without mm -hmm. specifying. Uh, there will probably be two leading reserve currencies, the dollar and the euro. Um, Japan has never fully internationalized the yen, and China is, has neither the transparency nor the financial openness needed for uh, the renminbi to be a, a reserve currency. But I see no reason why the dollar and the euro couldn't share this role uh, for a good long time going forward. You, uh, uh, in, in something that you wrote uh, with regard to the recent crisis, you talked about the divisions within Asia. Uh, and the whole notion there of the competition and conflict between Japan and China and the extent to which that interferes with, for example, China taking a leading role. Uh, so, so again, we're back to that situation where we come back to power, and in this case, international power, and the way international global politics affects what is doable in terms of, of economic reform. So there is, to take the Asian case, a very strong desire there for regional solidarity and to ring fence, ring fence the, the region against financial disturbances coming from outside, like the, the global credit crisis. And yet, uh, there hasn't really been an ability in Asia to collaborate mm. on an effective response. Korea was hit very hard in November of 08 by the global credit crisis, but it ended up getting support in the form of a dollar swap line from the Fed, mm 
rather than getting real money on, real cash on the barrelhead from China hmm. and Japan. And the reason for that is the Chinese and the Japanese couldn't agree. Uh, the Chinese wanted financial supports within uh, Asia because they know they're the big and increasingly dominant player in the region. And the Japanese wanted supports for Korea through the International Monetary Fund mm -hmm. because for historical reasons, Japan has uh, a much louder voice and more votes in the IMF than does China. Mm -hmm. so, so, in other words, we, the, the politics comes into play uh, when you, uh, when you uh, try to deal with these issues. Now, you, you say that you, you can envision uh, a, a future in which the euro and the dollar are reserve currencies, and this is going to affect uh, reform. It's going to make Europe much more important uh, with regard to the changes that will have to be made to deal with this crisis. Talk a little about that, because uh, uh, America is not going to be able to get what it wants uh, and has wanted in the past. At the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, the U.S. had a lot of leverage, not only as uh, the, the world's biggest economy, but as a result of lend-lease and uh, support for, for Europe during the war. Now it, it's uh, any reform will have to very much be a negotiation. Uh, it's clear. Um, Europe will have to learn to speak with one voice, which uh, has always been a challenge. So if reform is discussed at the International Monetary Fund, there is uh, a U.S. representative on the executive board, but there's no European representative. Mm -hmm. There are eight with limited votes and they don't speak uh, in harmony all the mm -hmm. time. Europe needs to move to a single chair in, in the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and have a common view uh, on these issues. But I think the problem, as you alluded to before, is even larger than that in that uh, once upon a time the U.S. and Europe essentially had veto power over whatever happened and could drive, as they did in 1944, these kind of negotiations. And now uh, uh, agreement on international monetary and financial reform, monetary reform without China, mm -hmm. means nothing, really makes no sense. And financial reform without the emerging markets a a as a group, which are increasingly prominent, important players in financial markets, similarly will mean nothing. Now, when, when this crisis broke, and I mentioned this uh, innovative online book which you co-edited, which was a set of papers written in a very short period of time to uh, uh, put ideas on the table for the G7 meeting, which was meeting in Washington. And, and so I'm, I'm curious here uh, what you see as, as the impact of ideas. In other words, look, we, we were talking about Europe. And you, you explained to us how they had to pivot to deal with the new economic situation. But, but they weren't dealing with collapse. They were dealing with stagnation. Clearly now it's, a, it's an order of magnitude greater in terms how, of how everything has, has fallen apart. So, so then the, 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 the question becomes how will ideas, power, and the functional needs of a new uh, 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 international uh, monetary system come together, do you think? Look, I'm an academic, so I have a vested interest mm -hmm. in the notion that ideas matter. And uh, I, I profoundly believe that. That's one of the reasons why I get up every morning. Um, and I think that we have seen this in the current crisis as uh, repeatedly uh, academics and others have put ideas on the table about what needs to be done to formulate a more effective response to the financial crisis. And you have, with unfortunately long lags, seen them taken up by policymakers. Um, to get right to your question, I think we're going to see uh, different coalitions form than we have in the past, reflecting uh, both the politics 
and the ideas that will be part of the mix. So early next week, there will be a meeting in London that will be hosted by Premier Wei of China and Gordon Brown hmm. of the UK. And they will discuss uh, what we need to do to fix the, the international financial architecture. I don't think they will arrive on the first day at a common uh, Anglo-Chinese position, but that will be part of the process. And that's an example of the kind of coalition that wouldn't have existed as recently as five years ago. Now, uh, I study the security field, and in that field, it's quite apparent that uh, uh, one of the hang-ups that the U.S. has is a failure by elites to recognize the extent to which uh, our power is diminished. Uh, and uh, even if they recognize it, not acting on it. What, 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 what do you see? Is there something comparable in the economic realm? Will, will kind of American nationalism and, and uh, uh, the, the kind of a divided government that we have with congressmen representing very conservative uh, constituents and so will that, will that uh, bring us down, do you fear, uh, uh, so that our response will be inadequate to these new realities? Or will it be so obvious that, you know, it's going to happen? Well, I don't know about bring us down, but it will have to change the tactics and strategies we use uh, to advance our interests. Uh, one example of, uh, of that in the monetary and financial realm would be when the Bush administration uh, took office in early 2001, it was strongly opposed to working through international monetary and financial institutions and didn't want to have any more to do with the International Monetary Fund mm. than it had to. It thought that it could bash China bilaterally and advance U.S. interests in terms of the dollar rem renminbi exchange rate. Over time, we realized that wouldn't work and we began to work increasingly through the International Monetary Fund. I think now again, we will see the U.S. working through international institutions, trying to build uh, international coalitions, and using our soft power. Uh, you know, the analogy with security carries right over. We have to use the power of ideas. Um, the Obama administration has some serious thinkers on these matters uh, on board, and it's going to have to use them uh, to effectively advance our interests. In, in, in the midst of all of this, the, 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 uh, what, what will be the consequences for globalization? Will it only be financial globalization that, that pulls itself in and the other forms will continue? So, uh, you know, as uh, Chairman Mao said, it's too early to tell, <laughs> as he said about the French Revolution, it, it is said. Um, my gut tells me that uh, there will be uh, some slowing and rollback of financial globalization, but not of globalization more broadly. And the reason for that is that globalization more broadly has been promoted by other more fundamental developments outside the financial sphere, mm. like the forward march of technology. We've had the development of uh, international supply chains and, pr and chains and production networks because of the internet and satellite telephony and other things that make it possible to coordinate production globally. The advantages of that are profound. Containerization has made it much easier to import and export merchandise. Um, and when people said after 9-11, globalization will be rolled back, we figured out how to use uh, x-rays and infrared technology mm -hmm. to inspect uh, the contents of containers without having to, to open them. I think there will be a, a, a variety of responses that will, to some extent, enable us to continue to take advantage of the fundamental benefits of globalization. One final question. As, as you look to the future, what do you see 
uh, as institutional change that you would like to see in the global financial institutions? Will it be new institutions, or will it be uh, a reshaping of institutions like the IMF? So forgive me for answering both. Mm -hmm. I think the existing institutions need to be updated for the 21st century, which means uh, better uh, governance, the rising powers need a uh, proper seat at the table, new tools suitable for the kind of uh, risks that they're uh, there to cope with. But in addition, we, I think we need new institutions, and my, um, uh, my personal example of that would be a world financial organization. We uh, deal with the uh, impact of uh, foreign trade policies on the U.S. economy and vice versa, partly through the rules and uh, enforcement mechanisms of the WTO. And the WTO can tell a country, including the U.S., if uh, your policies are not in conformance with your international obligations, you need to change them or incur penalties. And we do. My question would be, if we have a WTO, why can't we have a WFO, a World mm -hmm. Financial Organization, uh, which would set down obligations for its members about how to adequately supervise and regulate their financial markets and institutions that would have an uh, independent panel of experts to monitor compliance, and that could apply sanctions and penalties for countries that don't. Well, on that note and, and, and hope for the future, uh, Barry, uh, let me show these two books again, Globalizing uh, Capital and the European Economy Since 1945, as they are, they are quite in, uh, insightful and, and really are uh, uh, informative with regard to what we're going through now. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us, Barry. Uh, thank you, Harry. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.